Hello lovely people. Today I would like to go through some of my collection of myth and folktale collections and inspired things. Okay, I've had a little bit of a conundrum about how to do this video because I wasn't sure whether I should split it into only OG sources, but then at that point where do I draw the line between an original source and a retelling? It's gotten very confused. I've decided what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take you through my shelves, how it's shelved, because I sort of shelve thematically. So this will be original sourcing and some more contemporary things. If you'd like an actual video on books that are sort of like inspired by slash reimaginings of things like fairy tales and stuff like that, let me know because I can do that. For the sake of not spending my eternity doing this video, I've kind of had to draw like a little bit of a mental line, but mm, we'll see. But I'm going to start with Ancient Greece. So I have a shelf. It's here. It's currently empty. It's where like Ancient Greece and Ancient Rome sort of stuff goes. I will kick things off with my fave, and that is the Iliad. So, um, first up is Game Classics. This is the Martin Hammond translation. This is the first translation of the Iliad that I read and studied. This is a prose translation. I think it's a really good accessible prose translation. It's not my favourite translation of all, we'll get to that, but it was a really good way to sort of start off my journey. My current fave Iliad translation is this Penguin Classics, which is translated by Robert Fagels, which is a verse translation, and that's just because I prefer my epics to be in verse rather than in prose. To be honest with you, I'm holding out for the Emily Wilson Iliad translation because I think that when that happens it's going to be my fave, but until then, this takes the top spot. Um, after that, I also have this translation, which is Chapman's Homer. Chapman translated Homer in the 1600s, so this is in verse, and it's um, antiquated language. It's not necessarily the most accurate translation, but it is interesting to read as, like, um, a link in this chain of Iliad translations. Because we're doing this thematically, I will also mention some books which are more modern. So first of those is uh, War Music by Christopher Logue. This is sort of a retelling in verse of certain um, books of the Iliad. It very much takes out a lot of the plot and it's very focused on like masculine war side, as you might guess from War Music, but it is an interesting little one. And then also um, Memorial by Alice Oswald is a poem that is sort of um, based on this idea of um, things like the Iliad actually originating from being um, these poems that you tell to memorialise people who fell in a conflict that really happened. She's done this sort of uh, retelling poetry sort of thing that just focuses on um, the people who died and like it's really got some really beautiful like metaphors and stuff like that that are reworked um i think it's really great keeping to the sort of trojan war theme i also have the burial at thebes by seamus heaney which is sort of his poetry version of sophocles antigone um and i also want to mention cassandra by krista wolf which is sort of like a feminist novel that is from the perspective of cassandra who is the seer who prophesizes that no one believes and it's sort of very much like focusing on like women's experience during this time um, also honourable mentions to The Silence of the Girls, which I currently only have the dust jacket from because I lent it out to my friend, which is again um, focusing main character on Briseis and sort of these women who were taken as slaves during the Trojan War, and also Song of Achilles by Madeleine Miller, which usually lives on that portion of the shelf, um, but is also lent out to the same person. Moving on to the Odyssey. My first translation of the Odyssey that I read and studied was this one, also by Martin Hammond, which is also a prose translation of the Odyssey, um, which again, I studied it when I was at university. Again, I think it's a really good translation, like accessible and that sort of thing. My favourite translation of the Odyssey that I own is uh, Emily Wilson's translation. I just think it's great and it made me realise what reading translations that don't have quite so much like sexism in them is like, and I loved it. And again, I also have Chapman's Odyssey, which is from the 1600s. Also grouped together with those is Circe by Madeline Miller, because Circe, the sorcerer slash uh, demigod, is uh, originally from the Odyssey, so I shelved this one by all my Odyssey things. Next to those, following on from this sort of Trojan War tradition, I have my Troilus and Crusade sort of selection. So first up is Troilus and Crusade by Geoffrey Chaucer. This is like a Middle English verse telling the story of Troilus, who was a Trojan prince, and Crusade, whose father defected to the uh, Greeks during the Trojan War and sort of their doomed love affair. I shelve it near my Iliad and Odyssey stuff because thematically it ties into that story. 
Um, I also have uh, Troilus and Cressida, which is William Shakespeare's play version of the same. I prefer the Geoffrey Chaucer, if I'm honest with you. And then I also have A Double Sorrow, Troilus and Crusade, which is Lavinia Greenlaw, which is kind of a retelling. It's very, very short. Um, I thought it was absolutely very well done. So that's sort of a Trojan War moment. Moving on to some more Greek stuff in general. This is the Greek Myths Volume 1 and 2. Uh, this is the Folio Society edition with these beautiful uh, Lady on the Swan covers. This is the Robert Graves translation, immensely famous. I haven't read this all the way through yet, but it is um, an icon amongst Greek myth retellings, I know. Um, I also have The Life and Death of Jason by William Morris. This is a really sweet little edition, which is uh, telling the story of Jason and the Argonauts in verse. Some more classic Greek things. I have The Poetic by Alice Aristotle, which is a work of philosophy. I have Plato's Symposium, which is another work of philosophy. I have Stung with Love, Poems and Fragments by Sappho, which is a collection of Sappho's poetry. I really like this one because it has some of the poems that have been more recently discovered included alongside it. And I also have uh, Constellation Myths by Erastenes and Hyginus, which is a bunch of constellations myths to do with the stars. The next two I could not not mention because they were iconic in my experience of getting into Greek myths. First up is Greek Myths for Young Children, which was uh, my first Greek myth collection. This is, for example, Icarus. Um, I read this so much as a child, I really, really loved it. Um, and I think it's just a really sweet little collection. I also have Greek Myths and Legends with illustrations by Rodney Matthews. Rodney Matthews is a really iconic illustrator, especially if you're into like classic rock, stuff like Magnum and Hawkwind. He did a lot of their band covers. So obviously my parents bought this for me, which um, tells like that's the Minotaur, for example. Those are both two collections which were really like essential to me when I was a child. So I keep them alongside. Three more modern books that I also shelve alongside these are The Prey Singer by Mary Renner, which is a fiction book about Samoades, who was an ancient Greek poet and performer. Um, there's also Pandora's Jar, Women in the Greek Myths by Natalie Haynes, which is a collection of short stories about women from Greek mythology. And then to bridge my gap between um, Greek and Rome, I have Venus and Aphrodite, History of a Goddess by Bethany Hughes, which is examining this goddess through history. Leading on to my Roman section, I have less Roman stuff because I'm not as, not as hot on the Romans as on the Greeks. Um, this isn't a myth or a folk tale or a legend, but I do have Suetonius' The Twelve Caesars, which is uh, his account of Twelve Caesars, which I shelve alongside these because where else would it go? I also have The Aeneid by Virgil. This translation is by C. Day Lewis. Um, I also studied this one when I did my ancient epic module. I really like the Aeneid. I don't think it's like adapted as much as the Greek stuff and I would actually be really interested if anyone has any recommendations for like modern retellings or stuff like that, please do let me know. I also have Ovid's Metamorphoses. This translation is by David Rayburn. This is a verse translation. I really love the Metamorphoses. Um, I think there are some really interesting like tales and stuff like that in here. So I also have Ovid Metamorphos, which is edited by Philip Terry, which is a collection of short stories from different writers that are retelling some of these original stories in like new modern contemporary ways. Those are the Greek and Roman selections. Now I'm moving on to sort of the British Isles, but also sort of some other things. Coming over a little bit closer to home, I will start with sort of uh, folktale collections and then I might move on to some more like um, Arthurian based stuff. So to kick off my folk tales, I have Folk Tales of the British Isles, edited by Kevin Crossley Holland. I thought this was a really great collection actually. He just edited it, so it's a collection of folk tales from lots of different folklorists, and um, I just thought it was a really great introduction to some folk tales, like from where I'm from. Um, I haven't read this one yet, but this is Welsh Myths and Legends, 80 Myths and Legends from Across Wales by Graham Watkins. Uh, this was a Christmas present, so I will be reading this soon. I just haven't got to it yet, but it sounds very interesting. Um, I have read Botanical Folk Tales of Britain and Ireland by Lisa Schneidau. I think she does a really great job of giving you um, sources, so specifically where these tales are from and not just the country, but also like the region, like are they from Somerset? Are they from like Northumberland? Like where are they from? And then also she's retelling them in a way that works really well to be read aloud, I think. So this was a lovely collection that's all themed around um, sort of the passing of the seasons and plants and stuff like that. I also have this gorgeous collection of Celtic tales Fairy Tales and Stories of Enchantment from Ireland, Scotland, Brittany and Wales, illustrated by Kate Forrester. First of all, the illustrations for this are beautiful. Second of all, I really appreciated the inclusion of Brittany. When you look at like Celtic languages, like Breton is so linked to stuff like Welsh and Cornish and stuff like this. And um, I just appreciated that acknowledgement that just because um, Brittany is not um, part of Britain, that doesn't mean there's not like linguistic roots and mythology roots and stuff like that. So I really like this collection. We also have uh, Tales from the Celtic Countries by Rhiannon Evans, 
which is um, just a really sweet like illustrated collection of folk tales. Again, this was from when I was a kid and I really really loved it. Another one is uh, Folk Magic, Myth and Healing, An Unusual History of British Plants by uh, Fez Inkwright. This is just a really sweet collection of folk tales um, that are all themed around British plants, as well as also just giving you like some practical knowledge about what plants are used for and stuff like that. Um, they also did uh, bees in history, religion and law. This is not just based in the British Isles, but I I shelved them together because they're the same author. My shelving system is inconsistent and I make no apologies for it. This is all about bees, which is very, very interesting. And then The Woman Who Loved an Octopus and Other Saints Tales by Imogen Rhea Herod. Uh, this is looking at female saints, most of them based in Wales and sort of um, it's short stories that retell them so it tells you like the original myth at the beginning and then also then it like gives a short story that retells them um, this was not my favorite collection on the whole but there were a couple of stories in this that really stood out to me and I really really liked them shelved alongside those is also a portable shelter by Kirsty Logan these are short stories that are inspired a lot by uh, Scottish mythology and then also Diving Bells by Lucy Wood which are short stories that are inspired a lot by Cornish mythology um, I don't normally keep short story collections but I'm like massively more inclined to if they're based around like folk tales and mythology that I find interesting. Next up is this which is the Exeter Riddle book. This translation is by Kevin Crossley Holland. This is the uh, Folio Society edition. This is a selection of Old English riddles that have been translated from the Old English by Kevin Crossley Holland. I think they're just like a really iconic piece of Old English writing and I intend to work my way through them in drips and drabs. Um, I also have A Godothen by Anerin. This is the earliest known major work of literature from the British Isles. It's written in early Welsh. I haven't read it yet, but my partner has lent it to me because uh, he's really interested in um, Welsh language writing, especially older stuff and also just Celtic literature in general. So I'm really looking forward to this. This is not necessarily a folk or a myth thing. It's more of like an account of this battle that happened, but I thought I would mention it because if you're watching this video because you're interested in things, you might also be interested in this. After that is uh, this collection, which is from the Folio Society. This is a collection of um, British myths and legends, which is split by history and romance, heroes and saints, marvels and magic. They have these really gorgeous Sword in the Stone covers, which brings me on to my link to Arthurian-based literature. I'm not going to talk about like modern like fantasy retellings of Arthuriana although uh, if you again if you would like a follow-up video that's like um, fantasy retellings of like fairy tales, King Arthur, stuff like this I can go through what I have this is more like um, original sources and then also just some iconic retellings I'm a bit wish-washy and inconsistent and I I'm sorry <laughs> So next up is the Mabinogion. I've included this here because um, this is a very like foundational iconic piece of like Welsh uh, writing. It's just um, there are also like some of these tales are also like about Arthuriana so I thought I would slot it in at this point but also acknowledging that this is not strictly Arthuriana. This is also other tales which are also very very interesting and exciting. I like the Shona Davis translation because I listened to a really interesting uh, in our time episode all about the Mavenogion and they talked to her and I really appreciated all the stuff she was saying about translating and how she both tried to translate the meaning of things but also the sound of things and I just I've been told by my partner who has read a number of Mavenogion translations that this one is particularly good oh and he also speaks Welsh so I trust him on these things um I also have Sir Gawain the Green Knight um, edited by J.J. Anderson, along with uh, Pearl, Cleanness and Patience, which are all written, we think, by the same person. Again, I studied this one. I did a medieval romance module at university, and this was one of the texts that I studied. Um, I mainly did Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which obviously tells the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I haven't read this one yet, but this is Arthurian Romances by Christian de Troyes, who is an icon amongst sort of like the French tradition of Arthurian writings. This in particular has um, The Knight of the Cart, The Knight with the Lion, The Story of the Grail. So I know that this is a lot of where like the Lancelot and Guinevere stuff comes from, comes from like the French tradition. I know that Christian de Troyes is like such an icon in like these sorts of things so I am hoping to read this one very very soon but it is in the collection. Next up I have two versions of Thomas Mallory's Mort D'Arthur. First up is this one which is edited and abridged with an introduction by Michael Senior. Um, this has some really gorgeous illustrations throughout, well not even illustrations, it has like um, like pictures of manuscripts and stuff like this throughout which is really fabulous. It also has a bunch of Arthurian legend stamps in it that my parents collected and put in this. Here they are in case you too like stamps. 
Um, I also have The Romance of King Arthur, illustrated by Arthur Rackham, which is the Mort d'Arthur, but with uh, Arthur Rackham illustrations throughout, which is also really beautiful, and I read these ones really tentatively because I never want to destroy them with my lucky little hands. Moving on to Elizabethan, I also have The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, which again is not strictly um, an Arthurian retelling, but it is like an iconic piece of writing that deals with like fae and that sort of thing and there are some like nods and stuff to Arthurian stuff in here so uh, I just thought it's shelved with these things so I'm mentioning it here. Then moving on to uh, Victorian, this is um, Tennyson's Legends of King Arthur, Idols of the King. This is illustrated by Gustave Doré, who is another illustrator that I adore. He does these beautiful, beautiful full page black and white illustrations. This is really, really lovely. I also have a much more manageable version of Idols of the King, which is just this little sweet sweet, which is uh, obviously slightly easier to take around with you if you want to read on the go. Um, after that is The Defense of Guinevere and other poems by William Morris. Um, this has a number of poems in it which are drawing on Arthurian tradition. The Defense of Guinevere is a really interesting poem where Guinevere is like speaking in defense of herself and her actions and stuff. I think William Morris is someone who had a really interesting like connection and approach to like medieval concepts of relationships and stuff like this or at least like idealized chivalrous ideas of medieval relationships and stuff like that. So uh, again that's shelved alongside those. Then onto another iconic translation, much more modern this time, I have uh, The Sword in the Stone by T.H. White. This is a really sweet little edition that I picked up in a second-hand shop. It's kind of falling apart, but I really, really like the little owl. Um, and then my friend bought me this gorgeous edition of The Once and Future King by T.H. White, which is all of the books bound up in one, which um, is definitely... I read The Sword in the Stone from this edition, but I was very, very ginger about opening it and that sort of thing, so this one is going to be more accessible for me to continue and read and finish that journey. A final brief honourable mention to King Arthur's Britain, a photographic odyssey by John Matthews and Michael J. Stead. This is photographs from around Britain from different places that are linked to the Arthurian mythos, sort of themed by like concept like places where Merlin is associated, places that are associated with Camelot, stuff like this. It was just really lovely to get some like visuals of places that have sort of been linked to these legends and also inspired legends themselves. I will leave it there on Arthuriana. Again there are some slightly more like contemporary fantasy like returning to these things that I could mention but I'm gonna keep going for the sake of being concise. Moving on to some more like sagas. Um, I have the Orkney Inga saga, which is the history of the Earls of Orkney. I haven't read this one yet, but I am hoping to read it in 2021. Orkney is an island off the coast of Scotland, so um, hopefully this is going to be really interesting to just get a bit of a sense of like the history from there. Also have uh, the Toyn, which is um, translated by Thomas Kinsella. So it's part of the uh, 8th century Ulster cycle of uh, Irish myths and tales, and tales of this great cattle raid and all of this stuff, so this was also really fab. Um, I also have two translations of Beowulf. Um, this one is by uh, Michael Alexander, and then this one is by Seamus Heaney. I really love the Seamus Heaney translation. I also used to have a translation by Kevin Crosby Holland, but then I decided that maybe three translations was too many, so then I gave it to someone, and now I kind of regret that, and I wish I still had it, but like, you do what you do, don't you? Yes, you do. Transitioning slightly across the pond, I also have uh, The Saga of the Volsungs. This Penguin Classics translation is by uh, Jesse L. Bayok. This tells the story of Sigurd the Dragon Slayer and um, Valkyrie Brunhilde and stuff like this. Um, I also have uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's um, verse translation, The Legend of Sid and Gudrun, which is kind of an adaptation of this, but this was never finished. Um, so it's not a translation, but I shall them next to each other for obvious reasons. And continuing that sort of like um, Scandinavian Norse theme, I also have the Elder Edda, Myths, Gods and Heroes from the Viking World. This is translated by Andy Orchard and a lovely little cover. So <laughs> that sort of brings an end to that sort of focus. Finally, I want to end on some fairy tale collections and then just a couple of smattering collections of like folk tales and stuff like that from other places that I have. So, um, when it comes to fairy tales, I have uh, Charles Perrault's The Complete Fairy Tales, translated by Christopher Betts, which is a translation of some of the uh, classic French fairy tales that are like the original source for stories we love, like Sleeping Beauty and stuff like this. This is a really great translation, and it also has lovely illustrations, which I adore. I love a good illustration. We should know this by now. 
Um, I also have Household Tales, illustrated by Mervyn Peake, which is a collection of Brothers Grimm stories, and then I also have Philip Pullman's Grimm Tales, which are like his retellings of Grimm stories. So I haven't read either of these yet, but they live together because I will read them and they will inform each other, and it will be interesting. My final three books that I want to talk about are sort of miscellaneous. So um, The Magic Orange Tree and Other Haitian Folk Tales by Darren Volkstein is a collection of Haitian folk tales that she collected. Um, I would be really interested, I keep meaning to and I keep forgetting, I really want to um, see if there are any recordings of people speaking these because she sort of tries to preserve the way that the stories were told to her, which was really interesting, but I would love to actually hear from the people who were doing the telling, you know? Um, I also have Spider Woman's Granddaughters, Traditional Tales and Contemporary Writing by Native American Women, edited and introduced by Paula Gunn Allen. Um, this does have contemporary writing within it, but again, it also has some of those um, traditional tales and stories, so I'm um, hoping to get to this one in the not too far off future. And then finally, Russian Magic Tales from Pushkin to Platonov, edited by Robert Chandler, which is a collection of Russian magic tales. These are not all folk tales and traditional tales and stuff like that. There are also like more contemporary stories and stuff like that. But again, don't really know a huge amount about Russian folk tales, so I thought, let's give it a go. Okay, I think those are all the things I wanted to talk about. This um, I hope that this was interesting and not like hugely unfocused. I'm aware that I like shelve my things and approach my things like thematically rather than like strictly by like what is original and what is retellings and stuff like this. Um, I think I probably will do a video sometime that are like books that are um, either retellings of or inspired by like folk tales, fairy tales, mythology, stuff like that. Would that be interesting? I'm trying to do a few more videos that are drawing like on what I've already read rather than I think a lot of my stuff which is like what is to read because I thought this might be interesting. Let me know. But yes, I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these. I would love to hear any recommendations you have of like gaps in my collection because there's a whole bunch of them for sure. I'm aware that there are very much like geographical biases here. I would be really interested in like expanding my experience and reading of folktales and mythology and stuff like that. It's something that I'm going to work on and like bring more variety in. But yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I hope you're having a really, really lovely day, and I will see you next time for something different.